clear. Hallelujah. Blessed is your name, Yah. We praise you, God, for you alone are worthy, so worthy to be praised, Adonai. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for being with us, for taking care of us, for fighting for us, oh God. Oh, Daddy God, we couldn't make it without we, without you. We are so grateful, Father God, for all that you're doing for us and all that you, you continue to do for our, our family, our friends, those around us, Father God. We thank you, O God, for watching over Israel, O God, that you'll keep your people, O God, that you'll protect Israel, O God, from the enemy, Father God. You'll see in, see, let Israel see their hiding places and come up with strategies and things that they need to do, O God, to protect your people, to protect your land, O God. Father God, we know that you are with us too here, Lord, in this land. We are dispersed throughout the nations, Father God that you are watching out for your children, Father God. And we are grateful, O oh God, that we have you, Daddy God, and having you is having everything that we need, Father God. Daddy, thank you for this day, for the Shabbat, for bringing us together, O oh God, to stop with you, to rest with you, Father God, for you are in the midst of us, Father God. Thank you for taking care of our pastor Israel and working things out on her behalf, Father God. Daddy God, you are in the background just doing things, Father God, working things out, Father God. And we are so grateful, oh God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Torah. Thank you, oh God, for your leading and your guidance and your instructions, Father God. Thank you for taking care of us, oh God, Lord. Father God, for being careful for us, Father, even when we are not careful for ourselves, oh God. Thank you for showing us what we need to do to get our lives in order, Father God, for you are a God of order and you want your people to walk orderly and circumspectly, Father God. Thank you for placing those people around us that you need us to pray for, that you need us to minister to, Father God. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your loving kindness towards us, Father God. And we give honor and praise to you always in the matchless name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Welcome to Hebrew Institute Live. How many of us can honestly say, Lord, not thy will? Not my will, my will, but thy be done. Not my will, but thine be done. I think, Connie, you're next. I'm just very full today. This is Connie from Tampa. Reading you from the Blue Letter Bible, 2 Timothy, the second chapter, 8 through 21. Remember that Yeshua HaMashiach, the seed of David, was raised from David according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bombs, but the word of Elohim is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation, which is the Messiah, Yeshua, with eternal joy. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. For if we deny him, he will also, he will, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the before Yahweh, that they strive, that they strive not about words to no profit, but the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto Elohim, a worketh man that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as though a caker, of whom is Hapilius and Phytus, who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim standeth sure. Having this seal, Yahweh knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of the Messiah depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver and of silver, but also of wood and of earth 
and, to, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctify and meet for the master's use and prepare unto every good work. Shabbat Shalom. Hermain. I mean, you're. I can't hear you there. You mute it. Okay, there you go. Okay, I, I continue on with uh, the same uh, chapter, verse uh, 22. And it says, Now flee from youthful desires. Instead, pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and shalom with those who call on, on Yahweh from a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant Disputes, knowing that they produce quarrels. Yahweh's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, tolerant. Let him give guidance with humility to those who are in opposition. Perhaps Yahweh or Elohim may grant them a change of mind leading to the knowledge of truth. Then they may regain their senses and escape the devil's snare in which they had been held captive by him to do his will. Shabbat Shalom. Katrina? Shabbat Shalom. This is Katrina from North Carolina. I'll be reading Jude 1 through 10. Jude, the servant of Yeshua, Hamashiach, the brother of James. To them are sanctified by Elohim, the Father that preserved in Yeshua HaMashiach, and call mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Be loved when I gave all my diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you, to exhort you, and you should earnestly contend for faith which was once delivered unto the saints. But there are certain men creeped and worried, who were before of old ordained to his condemn, condemning, condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our Elohim and lavish and denying only the Lord Elohim. Our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, I, I will therefore put in memories through ye. Once knew this is how the Lord have saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Afterward destroyed them that believed not and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Even as Solomon and Gomorrah and the cities about them in the manner of giving them, themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for the example, suffering a vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also the filthy dreams and the foul of flesh despise Diamond, um, dominion of speaking evil dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, angel, we content with the devil. He dispute about the body of Moses, thirst not 
bringing against him and railing, accusing, but saying, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as a brute beast. In those things they corrupt themselves. Shabbat Shalom. Borsi. Shabbat Shalom. This is Borsi from North Carolina. I will be continuously reading the book of Jude, verses 11 through 20. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the ways of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam, for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, Adam and I come with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that they are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sins have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaks, speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of Adonai, or Yahweh, Yeshua HaMashiach. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensuously, having not the spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat, um, <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I will continue hold on. to read. Hold this on, hold on. Let me see Keep yourself in love, uh, Elohim, looking for the mercy of our Lord, Hamashiach, unto eternal life. And as some have compassion, making difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of fire, hating even the garment and spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling into the present of flawlessness before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Sis, oh, Bene. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Do I need to wait, Pastor? No, 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 no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh. So I'm want to make sure. Shabbat Shalom. This is Renee from North Carolina. I'll be reading from 1 Samuel, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and there inaugurate the monarchy. So all the people went to Gilgal and there at Gilgal, they declared Saul king before Yahweh. They offered sacrifices of well-being there before Yahweh. And Saul and all the men of Israel held a great celebration there. Then Samuel said to all Israel, I have yielded to you and all you have asked of me and have set a king over you. Henceforth, the king will be your leader. As for me, I have grown old and gray, but my son's still with you. And I have been your leader from my youth to this day. Here I am. Testify against me in the presence of Yahweh and in the presence of his anointed one. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Or whom have I robbed? From whom have I taken a bribe? 
to look the other way. I will return it to you. They responded, you have not defrauded us and you have not robbed us. You have taken nothing from anyone. He said to them, Yahweh then is witness and his anointed is witness to your admission this day that you have found nothing in my possession. They responded, he is. Samuel said to the people, Yahweh is witness. He who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt, come stand before Yahweh while I cite against you all the kindnesses that Yahweh has done to you and your fathers. Then Jacob came to Egypt. Your fathers cried out to Yahweh and Yahweh sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot Yahweh their Elohim. So he delivered them into the hands of Sisera, the military commander of Hazor, into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the kind of the kind of Moab. And these made war upon them. They cried to Yahweh, we are guilty for we have forsaken Yahweh and worship the Balaam and Asherah. Oh, deliver us from our enemies and we will serve you. And Yahweh sent Yerubbabel and Bedan and Yepta and Samuel and delivered you from the enemies around you and you dwelt in security. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites was advancing against you, you said to me, no, we must have a king reigning over us, though Yahweh your Elohim is your king. Well, Yahweh has set a king over you. Here is the king you have chosen that you have asked for. If you will revere Yahweh, worship him and obey him and will not flout Yahweh's command if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow Yahweh your Elohim well and good. But if you do not obey Yahweh and you flout Yahweh's command, the hand of Yahweh will strike you as it did your fathers. Now stand by and see the marvelous thing that Yahweh will do before your eyes. It is the season of the wheat harvest. I will pray to Yahweh and he will send thunder and rain. Then you will take thought and realize what a wicked thing you did in the sight of Yahweh when you asked for a king. Samuel prayed to Yahweh and Yahweh sent thunder and rain that day. Sorry. And the people stood in awe of Yahweh and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, intercede for your servants with Yahweh your Elohim that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins the wickedness of asking for a king. But Samuel said to the people, have no fear. You have indeed done all those wicked things. Do not, however, turn away from Yahweh, but serve Yahweh with all your heart. Do not turn away to follow worthless things, which can neither profit nor save, but are worthless. For the sake of his great name, Yahweh will never abandon his people, seeing that Yahweh undertook to make you his people. As for me, Far be it for me to sin against Yahweh and refrain from praying for you. And I will continue to instruct you in the practice of what is good and right. Above all, you must revere Yahweh and serve him faithfully with all your heart and consider how grandly he has dealt with you. For if you persist in your wrongdoing, both you and your king shall be swept away. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Do not be afraid of evil tidings. Do not be afraid of evil tidings, for I have promised that the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in me. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. I will keep you from all harm. I will watch over your life. I will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. 
I have honored the prayer of my son who prayed for you by saying, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. Do not be afraid. You will not be overcome with evil, but you will overcome evil with good. Father, because of your deliverance, we will not be afraid of evil tidings. We will not be visited with evil, for you will preserve us from all evil. Be pleased to save us, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help us. May all who want to take our lives be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire in our ruin be turned back in disgrace. For we will seek you and will rejoice and be glad in you because of your saving help. Amen. Renounce all sexual sin. My child, I urge you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your true and proper worship to me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Flee from sexual immorality, for you are not your own. You were bought at the great price of my son's death. It is my will that you should be sanctified and that you should avoid all sexual immorality. Learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. For I did not call you to be impure, but to live a holy life. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Father, we renounce all sexual sin of our past and command all spirits of lust and perversion to come out in the name of Yeshua. We release the fire of God to burn out all unclean lusts from our lives. We receive the spirit of holiness in our lives to walk in sexual purity and we loose ourselves from the spirit of the world. We overcome the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be reading portion summary and this week in Bible history. Torah was the name of a prominent Levite. It is also the name of the 38th reading from the Torah. It comes from the first verse of this week's reading, which says, now Korah, the son of Izar, took action, number 16, one. This week's Torah reading tells the story of how Korah led an unsuccessful rebellion against Moses and Aaron. After throwing the insurrection, Elohim confirms Aaron in the priesthood and provides additional legislation regarding priestly and Levitical privileges and responsibilities. Spies dispatch Siphon 29, 13-12 BCE. Moses dispatched 12 spies to tour the Holy Land in preparation for its conquest by the people of Israel. Birth and passing of Joseph. Tammuz 1, 1562 and 1452 BCE. Joseph, the son of the patriarch Jacob, was born in Haran, Mesopotamia, in the first of Tammuz of the year of 2199 from creation, 1562 BCE. The first child of Jacob's most beloved wife, Rachel, born after seven childless years of marriage, he passed away on the same date 110 years later in Egypt. When Joseph was six years old, Jacob and his family returned to the Holy Land, evidently settling in Hebron. Though younger than 10 of his 11 brothers, he was his father's favorite and a great rivalry existed between him and his brothers, whose anonymously towards him animosity towards him increased when he re related two dreams he had forecasting that he is destined to rule over them. When Joseph was 17, he was sold into slavery by his brothers and taken to Egypt. When he refused the advances of his master's wife, he had him placed in prison 
where he languished for 12 years at age 30. He interpreted a pair of mysterious dreams dreamt by Pharaoh and was appointed viceroy of Egypt over, over to oversee the gathering and storage of grain in preparation for the seven years of famine and Pharaoh's dreams have predicted. He married Asnat and had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. The great famine brought his brothers to Egypt to purchase grain after subjecting them to a series of trials to test their loyalty to each other and their remorse over what they had done to him. Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers, was reconciled with them, and settled his father and entire family, 70 souls in all in Egypt. Joseph passed away in Egypt on his 110th birthday and first of his brothers to die. He transmitted to them the divine promise to Jacob that his children will be taken out of Egypt and restored to their homeland and made them promise to take his remains with them when they go. Joshua stops the sun, Tammuz 3, 1273 BCE. On the third of Tammuz of the year of 2488 from creation, 1273 BCE, Joshua was leading the Jewish people in one of the battles to conquer the land of Israel. Victory was imminent, but darkness was about to fall. Sun proclaimed Joshua, be still at Gibeon moon at Ayalon Valley. Joshua 10, 12, the heavenly bodies at Kiwisis, Kiwi, hmm, acquiesced, halting their progress through the sky until Israel's arm, armies brought the battle to a successful conclusion. Ezekiel's vision of the chariot, Tammuz 5, 429 BCE, on the 5th of Tammuz of the year 3332 from creation, 429 BCE, Ezekiel among the only prophets to prophesy outside of the Holy Land, beheld the vision of the divine chariot representing the spiritual infrastructure of creation. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Insurrection and Punishment, God style. <laughs> Subtitle, Jealousy, Lust, and the Thirst for Honor. Number 16, one. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Koi, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliel, and On, the son of Peli, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, even one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourself above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard that, he fell on his face. Numbers 12, three said that Moses, was a very humble man, more so than any man on the face of the earth. So the acquisition against Moses is, Moses, who do you think you are? Remember, it was just two Torah portions ago, back to Behel Akkah, where we had the people complaining against the Lord about meat, and Miriam and Aaron jealously against their younger brother Moses and his Cushite wife. This week, more drama in the wilderness, this time we have Korah griping against Moses and Aaron. Remember Numbers 12 too. They, Miriam and Aaron said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Once again, Moses, who do you think you are? Has he not spoken to us as well, giving voice to the spirit of jealousy? This week it's Korah's time. 
Same spirit accompanied with the thirst for honor and the lust for power. We find in the New Testament, 1 John 2, 16 to 17, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of the God abides forever. So Korah has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Korah had a gripe against Moses and Aaron. Like Moses and Aaron, Korah was a Levite. He resented Moses for appointing Aaron and his sons to the priesthood and making the rest of the Levites their servant. He felt that Moses was abusing his position of leadership and indulging in nepotism by favoring his brother Aaron. Korah insisted that all Levites should enjoy the privileges and rewards of the priesthood and that the entire symbol of Israel was holy enough to serve in the tabernacle. Korah made a big mistake. He didn't know that God did that appointing, but anyway, we shall see. Korah, a cousin of Moses from the distinguished tribe of the Levites, felt prey to two of the three sins which the sages teach are sources of all destructive character trait, jealousy and honor, and the thirst for honor. The third character trait is lust. In its obsession, Korah forms rebellion and tries to unseat Moses and Aaron. Vayit Kakora and Korah took. That word of Yikak, Strong's H3947, is like kak, also implies to buy. And Korah took are the opening words of the parashah. And our sages explain that he took. In effect, he seduced people with persuasive words. He duped them. He managed to incite 250 leaders of the nation to join him. Now, let's take a look at insurrection and punishment, God style. Go with me a for a moment to our favorite commentary, JPS Tanakh, number 16, 1 to 35. The rebellions of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. These rebellions against divinely appointed leadership of Moses and Aaron. So Moses and Aaron's leadership is not Moses' idea. They're divinely appointed leaders. These constitute public defiance that require swift and harsh punishment. Like other rebellions in the wilderness, these begin with a few individuals and spread to the community at large. Two insurrection stories are interwoven by the redactor. One involves Korah, a Korahite Levite, who demands a share of the Aaronic priesthood. The second has three Reubenites, two brothers, Dathan, Abiram, and a third individual, On, who questions the authority of Moses. So this week we have two plots interwoven. It is interesting to note that there are three Reubenites involved in this insurrection all descendants of Jacob's elder son, Reuben, who in spite of demonstrating some good qualities in his life, committed a capital offense against his father, Jacob, to which Jacob responded in Genesis 49, three through four. He says to Reuben, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and excellency of power. However, unstable as water, you should not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Reuben was denied the honor of the birthright of the firstborn, opening the door for Judah to excel in excellency. Because of his jealousy, Korah accuses Moses and Aaron of using their claims of divine authority as a way of increasing their own power and control over the Israelites. And his challenge resonated with 250 other men of renown who joined him in rebellion. The rebel leaders assemble followers. Defiance of Moses is clearly tied to the miseries of the wilderness experience and doubts surrounding the eventual settlement of Canaan. In other words, they doubt the word of God. On the other hand, the challenge of Aaron deals with the legitimacy of priests' exclusive power vis-a-vis -vis the Levites, who had a secondary role in the cult that was much less prestigious than the priestly. Both situations are evolved by divine wrath. That was the conclusion to the JPS to not commentary on number 16, one to 35. Back to our subtitle, Insurrection and Punishment God Style or Divine Wrath. Those who participated in the Korah's rebellion had all their own hidden agenda. First and foremost among them were Dathan and Abiram who had a long history of attacking Moses and harbored a desire to return to Egypt. Then there was the neighboring tribe of Reuben Korah convinced him that Moses was guilty of nepotism, stating that it was not by the command of God that Moses had appointed Aaron as high priest, but rather it was his own ambition to keep all high honor for his own family. 
Korah's argument fell on the willing ears since following the sin of the golden calf, Reuben has lost his privileged position as firstborn. Reuben's vulnerability also lay in his close proximity to Korah, reinforcing the warning of our sages, woe to the wicked, woe to his neighbors. We must be careful when choosing a place of residence for our neighbors can influence us without us even realizing it. This applies to Dayton and Nibiru, neighbors of Korah. So we have a neighborhood in which we have Korah, Dayton and Nibiru living close to each other. Dathan and Abiram were neighbors with a contentious man. That is why they were punished with him and were swept away from the world. So be careful when listening to gossip. You know that we speak of Lashon Ara, someone speaking evil, but also if you're listening and your ears are receiving it, you're just as guilty as the speaker. Contention against leadership is contagious and contentious people work hard to convince their camp companions to their just cause. Congressional, I'm sorry, congregational, rebellions often start in a small study group, special projects committees, or volunteer crews where a single discontent layman can publish his gripe against leadership and raise sympathy. As a disciple of Yeshua, we need to be worried and not fall into the trap of sedition. Paul warns us not to even listen to accusations against congregational leaders, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. We find that in 1 Timothy 5.19. 1 Timothy 5.19, against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Peter tells younger men in the congregations, be subject to your elders, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself to elders. Ye all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the pride and giveth grace to the humble. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who were given account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief for this will be unprofitable for you, Hebrews 13, 17. Congressional, congregational interaction usually begins with one or two disenfranchised people who have a grievance, real or imagined against leadership. I'm saying congregational in this reading. It could also be congressional in our Current tense. <laughs> <laughs> they share their grievance with others who will listen. Be careful about granting a listening ear that you find yourself doing more than just listening. Remember, if someone's speaking Lashana Ra and you're a listener, you're just as guilty as the one who's speaking it. Korah and its followers did not deserve that second chance. And one, it is one thing to face a challenge and fail, but to create a crisis, to sow the seeds of disunity among the congregation of Israel, to generate strife and not necessarily challenge and unnecessarily challenge the leadership of Yahweh's people, these sins cannot be excused or forgiven. Over 14,700 people died because of listening to the wrong voice, the voice of disunity, punishment God's style. Korah took his personal agenda and planted it on a national stage. I didn't write that, that's in here. He put the congregation <laughs> of Israel at risk. This type of threat cannot be overlooked or tolerated. Torah teaches that when we build a space in our lives for God, God dwells among us or within us. Being a leader doesn't make one closer to God, and any leader who thinks that it does is in need of doing some serious internal work. Torah also teaches us in this portion that when people jockey for power, as Korah did, and as follows, damage is done to the entire community. Torah shows us a model for leadership in Moses and Aaron who act in the best interest of the people they serve, even though the community has added insult to injury by blaming them for the damage experienced by those who are attacked them. And Torah offers us a path of healing from this kind of communal division. The Torah offers many examples to illustrate the tensions between legitimate and illegitimate challenges to authority. For example, God responds to Abraham's argument in defense of innocent citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. By engaging in a reasonable debate and making a reasonable compromise, in contrast, Pharaoh responds to Moses' request for the Israelites to be given a three-day festival by increasing the brutality of their slavery. And in the related story in the book of Numbers, the daughters of Zelophe petition Moses to address unfair land inheritance policies. In doing so, they note that their deceased father was not a part of Korah's rebellion, explicitly join the distinction between their own challenge to authority and that of Korah. 
In other words, they're saying we have a legitimate complaint. Not only are they successful in pleading their particular case, but Moses, we struck this law in response to their argument, creating a more and just distribution system under the Torah. Their success represents an example of using an established legal process rather than resorting to threats of violence or insurrection. And Moses' measures response represents a legitimate exercise of authority in response to a reasonable challenge. We cannot leave without discussing Moses once again. Let's look quickly back to Exodus 32, 30 through 40 to show how leadership works. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Perhaps I can intercede for you. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive them, but if not, I pray thee, blot me out of your book which you've written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now therefore go, lead this people to the place which I have spoken to you. And the answer to Moses and the rest, God says, behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit the punishment upon them for their sin. So Moses makes a request to God, even though the people had sinned, and God granted Moses' request. These stories, the Torah articulate examples of legitimate dissent and authority's reasonable response to it. Korah's rebellion is illegitimate and meets with disaster. The daughters of Zelophehad made a reasonable petition and met with success. Reasonable challenges to reasonable authorities ought to be accepted. Abraham's challenge to God is appropriate and is met with a reasoned discussion. Moses' petition to Pharaoh for an Israelite festival is met with tyrannical oppression. Illegitimate authority will respond inappropriate and may be challenged more aggressively as demonstrated by Yahweh's response with plagues. Well, finally in closing, let's do one additional scripture. Let's jump to Hebrews 12, 15. It says, see to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminate many. The Torah says that Korah took, Vayakak, he seduced, he influenced, he brought others in his direction, into the insurrection because of a root of bitterness springing up in his heart and thus contaminated many. Over 14,700 people, according to today's reading, died because of the influence of one wealthy persuasive man. Keep that in the back of your mind. Interesting fact, just before we close, Korah is mentioned in the Quran by the name of Karun, also Croesus, considered to be one of the richest men in history. He is recognized as wealthy. He became very arrogant due to his pride and arrogance. He gave credit of his wealth to his knowledge instead of God. Korah was a self-made man. Insurrection and punishment, God style. Subtitled jealousy, lust, and the thirst for honor, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. That was very good, Ed. Very, very good. I tell you, if you don't believe uh, we are in real times with God, as everyone paying attention to what's going on in Russia right now, how a so-called trusted general has risen up and is now okay, promoting a rebellion against the leader of that country. When I look at what's going on in the world and what's going on in our Torah portion, we need to take these times seriously, people. Okay, we need to take these times seriously as to what's going on. God has called us as witnesses. You understand what I'm saying? So when we see the Torah portion tells us how we are to walk that week. The reason that we do the uh, This Week in Bible history is so that you know what's going on in this cycle, okay? And can plan accordingly, or at least you know something's going on with me. What's going on with me? Let me look and see what's going on in the Torah. Okay, what's going on in the Bible? And it's like, ah, that's why I'm having these difficulties. All right. The reason for that also is that the Bible not only tells you what is going on, it often gives you a solution how to get 
out of what is going on. And when you do it God's style, you have God's results. When we act under our own strength, guess what? God will let you act under your own strength. However, you won't have his results for it, okay? So just like the children of Israel decided they were going to go after God said, uh-uh, don't go, 30 years, you're going to be here 40 years. No, we're going to go. We're going to show God we can do this thing. And what wound up happening? Nope, didn't work out for them, okay? And so anyway, we see uh, after that, you know, there's a lot going on with this with this week's Torah portion. All right. And uh, um, let me see. Let me go to my, my notes here. My notes here. Because the title that I got was Keep Your Attitude to Yourself. <laughs> Keep Your Attitude to Yourself. All right. You know, because you can be influenced by someone else's bad attitude. You see it at work. You come in all cheerful and everything. And then you got somebody give you the side eye and, and you say hello to them and they give you a nasty, you know, nasty hello. And next thing you know, man, I feel like I just got slime. I got an attitude for the rest of the day. You know, keep your attitude to yourself. All right, you got a problem, it's your problem. It's not my problem, it's your problem, okay? Now, when you look at Korah, you gotta think about this, okay? Korah carried the ark. He carried the ark of the covenant. You understand what I'm saying? The ark representative of the throne of God, okay? No one else could go in there but Aaron and his sons at an appointed time. Yet every time God was ready to move and Aaron did his part, Korah got to come in and carry the ark. That was his only job, to carry the ark. He could carry the ark. Or maybe he wanted to carry the table of showbread. Or maybe he wanted to carry the menorah. No one else could touch those things under normal circumstances. But he could. You see what winds up happening when we get our heads screwed on wrong and we start listening to the wrong voice. Uh, this is another Genesis chapter 3 situation. Okay? Because what was Korah really doing? He was trying to define good and evil in his own image. Half God said, isn't that what he said? Half God said, you need to recognize the voice of the serpent when he speaks to you because he will always question what God said to you. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. When you know what God said, the voice of the enemy will always question that, okay? Now, there are times when a voice, okay, if you are going in the wrong direction, God will send a voice to have you think about what it is that was said. But you have to listen to the voice. Is it a voice questioning, once again, or challenging? And who are they questioning or challenging? Because the right voice will always point you back to God's word, okay, once again, and God's will. It will the right voice will always wind up bringing you closer to God, okay? The wrong voice will lead you away, okay? So, here we need, we need, once again, here's Korah carrying the ark, the throne of God. And then we have a rebellion, okay? And that rebellion, once again, he convinced others. And I want you to think about this. Last year, we talked about Korah's rebellion as a cancer or autoimmune disease, remember? Okay, we talked about that. I'll go over that just briefly because I want to get into some other things, okay? So, Cora, an autoimmune disease in the body, all right? Now, 
An autoimmune disease is a condition in which your immune system mistakenly attacks your body. The immune system normally guards against germs like bacteria and viruses. When it senses these foreign invaders, it sends out an army of fighter cells to attack them. Is that not what the purpose of the Levites were? They were the ones, the shock troops, to guard the tabernacle. Okay, to guard the tabernacle, guard that holiness, okay? So, you know, here we go. And the current environment that Korah is in right now is so important to understand. And we have to really go back to last week's Torah portion, okay, to uh, understand where the people are at the time we see Korah coming in. So one of the things to understand, okay, from the time they left Egypt, from the time they left Egypt, they were always thinking they were going out, they were brought out into the wilderness to die. Every time they had a problem. Oh, why didn't you leave us in Egypt? You brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to die, constantly accusing God. All right. Now, when you think about that, you have to look at, in some cases, like, um, I tell you what, let's go to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And this is, is kind of a warning kind of that I saw. Exodus 14. Come on, we're getting there eventually. Jeez. Okay. Exodus chapter 14 versus let's look at verse number 11 okay well, i'll start at verse 10 set up the tone as pharaoh drew near the israelites caught sight of the egyptians advancing upon them greatly frightened the israelites cried out to yahweh good response and they said to moses was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us here to die in the wilderness? Key words, die in the wilderness. What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt saying, let us be and we will serve the Egyptians for it's better for us to serve the Egyptians than to what? Die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, have no fear, stand by and witness the deliverance which Yahweh will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. Yahweh will battle for you. Hold your peace. So right after we see, okay, their, their exit, the exodus, first crisis. Okay, you brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to die. How many times have we been there? Oh, we've done everything that God said for us to do. And then here comes this big crisis. All right, here comes our past riling up once. As soon as we think everything is okay, here comes our past once again. How you respond to that makes a big difference on how God responds to that thing and also responds to you. Now, let me ask you something. This is Exodus chapter 14, right? What is this before? I want you to think about it. It's before Exodus chapter 19 and 20. In other words, Prior to entering into the covenant, they make accusations against God, but he responds to them positively. They make accusations about manna or we have nothing to eat. They make accusations about water. They make accusations and prior to Mount Sinai, you see God respond favorably to them. And there's a reason. There is a reason for that that is so important. All right, just hold that thought for a minute. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 35. Now, Numbers chapter 14 is after. 
after Mount Sinai. Numbers chapter 14, let's go. Verse number 35 again. All right. So uh, let's see here. This is after the spies come back and everything. Let's go to verse number 34. All right. No, no, no. I'll tell you what. Let's go to verse number 26. Yahweh spoke further to Moses and Aaron, saying, how much longer shall that wicked community keep muttering against me? Very well. I have heeded the insistent muttering of the Israelites against me. Say to them, as I live, says Yahweh, I will do to you just as you have urged me. Remember how we were talking about measure for measure? How Yahweh will reflect upon you what you are reflecting upon him. Now, you know why this really sends chills up my, my, my spine? Because when we went to Exodus, the beginning of the Exodus, Exodus chapter three, Exodus chapter six, Yahweh said to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen what is going on with them. So God heard their, the reason they are where they are is because God heard them. So their accusation now is as if God don't hear us. Like God is a liar to accuse him of the same things after covenant than before covenant is to say God is a liar. Not only that, but in some cases, that is almost a sense of pride. Why do I say pride? Because I am so important that God got to lie to me. He's lying to me. Okay. And these are things that we need to think about sometimes. All right. So he's very clear here. Okay. As I live. Now, what is he saying? When you see something like that, as I live. He's taking an oath. Hebrew says, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. So as I live, says Yahweh, I will do to you just as you have urged me. Be careful what you ask God for. All right. In this very wilderness shall your carcasses drop. All of you who were recorded in your various lists from the age of 20 years up, you who have muttered against me. Not one or not one shall enter the land which I swore to settle you, save Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Your children who you said would be carried off, these will I allow to enter. They shall know the land that you have rejected. So it's not only you said God was a liar, you rejected the things God had told you. You rejected God. Remember, the Torah, the people, the land are one. Reject one, you're rejecting them all. You see, they are in the wilderness because of a promise that God made Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. So the implication of rejection of this is not that I'm just lying to you, but you're accusing me of lying to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because I told Abraham, to your descendants will I give this land. And by your rejection of it, it places the promise that I gave Abraham in jeopardy. You understand? Oh, no, you need to understand that. Why? Because we are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua. You understand what I'm saying? This is why it's so important to understand and study Torah so that you know what the promises are so you don't get into foolish, foolish rejection. Calling, uh, Listen, I have yet to see anybody in this Bible who called God a liar, and it turned out well for them. How many times do we do that? 
Oh, God. Continue reading here. All right. He goes on to say, um, but your carcasses shall drop in this wilderness while your children roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your faithlessness. Why are our children so, oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. What's going on with the kids today? Depression, all these kind of things. Suffering for what? The faithlessness, not faithfulness, faithlessness of their parents until the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. You shall bear your punishment for 40 years corresponding to the number of days 40 days that you scouted the land, a year for each day. Thus you shall know what it means to thwart me. I, Yahweh, have spoken. Thus I will do to all that wicked band that has banded together against me. In this very wilderness shall they die to the last man. Okay, and we know what happens to those that uh, actually uh, uh, went over to the promised land, the spies, all right? So after that, we see the people go into mourning. They're crying all night. They're in mourning, extreme mourning. Why is that important? Because everything right now is being set up for what goes on in this week's Torah portion. They're in extreme mourning. When they would go into mourning, someone would go into mourning, what would they do? They would what? Pluck out their hair, rent their garment, cut themselves. Signs of extreme mourning. What would they do? Attack their own body. Attack their own body. Pulling out the hair for bald spots. Do you think it is any coincidence that Korah's name means bald? It means bald, all right? So the people are in extreme mourning. They're overcome by grief. Then we see after grief, all right, comes denial. Oh, we're gonna go up anyway. So they deny what God says, once again, in defiance, still in defiance. It's important that when you are ministering, you understand the cycle of grief. That person will be hit by trauma. They will cry, they will grieve. Then they go through a phase, I just can't believe this. And in fact, it's like shock. They go into kind of denial. You may see them joking around with everyone, laughing, and people are trying to figure out what is going on. Why? Oh, they're taking this really well. No, there's a part of them that is in denial because you are going through a grief so big that if you let it go, you might leave this earth yourself. All right. Then that denial, okay, goes into rage and anger because of the helplessness, your helplessness you felt. So we see the people in mourning. They were overcome by grief. I think that is uh, Numbers chapter 14. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14. Okay, Numbers 14, verse number 39. Let me see here. Numbers verse 39, when Moses repeated these words to all the Israelites, the people were overcome by grief. Morning, then early next morning, they set out towards the crest of the hill saying, we are prepared to go to the place that Yahweh has spoken of, for we were wrong. There comes denial. Okay, we see that right there. And then we see what uh, Moses says, and defiantly, defiantly, verse 44, they marched towards the crest of the hill country, though neither Yahweh's Ark of the Covenant nor Moses stirred from the camp. 
and the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that hill country came down and dealt them a shattering blow at Hormah. Then the next thing that we see, all right, skip over chapter 15, is chapter 16. So chapter 14 deals with grief and denial. Chapter 16 is where we see the rage, anger, and rage in the congregation. And we see that two ways, okay? Once again, God is giving us a hint, all right? Korah, Korah, meaning bald as in mourning, okay, as in mourning. Then we have Dathan and Abiram. They re represent that rage and anger okay, at their situations, rage and anger, all right, in fact, they make it very, very personal who their rage and anger is against, all right, now, let's look at what Korah says, go to chapter 16, verse number one, now, Korah, son of Esar, son of Kohath, of Levi, so guess what we have here, we have Levi. Levi entered into Egypt with his son Kohath. Here we are, this genealogy, reverse genealogy here. Okay, with that. So we know who Korah is. He's not just anybody. We know exactly who Korah is, all right? But took himself along with Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and on sons of Peleth, descendants of Reuben. Who was Reuben? The firstborn. Who usually gets the rights of the priesthood? The firstborn. So do you think it is any accident that Korah goes to Reuben? Not at all. Okay. He has issues about who's in charge. So what does he do? Go to those who he can convince because they should have been in charge as the firstborn, okay? Then he goes to Reuben to uh, rise up against Moses together with 250 Israelites, chieftains of the community, chosen in the community, men of repute. So these weren't just anyone. Let me tell you how slick he is, Korah is. He chose those who the people chose themselves. So they represent the will of the people. So if I'm going to do something against them, you also do something against those who chose them. These were elected officials by the people that were to express their will in this government. Okay, Cora, all right, once again, knew who he was going to. The problem is, once again, those who represent the people, okay, they're not only intercessors, but what? They can also be the vehicle through which punishment comes because you made that choice. Understand something. You chose these men of repute. Are you in the position you are today because of who you chose to represent you in the government? Who did what? Instead of expressing the will of the people are expressing their own will and desire. Hello. Chapter 16, are we there yet? All right. So, what did they say? They combined against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. For all the community are holy, all of them, and Yahweh is in their midst. Why then do you raise yourselves above Yahweh's congregation? Keep that thought for a moment. 
When Moses heard this, he fell on his face. Then he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, come morning, Yahweh will make known who is his and who is holy and will grant him access to himself. He will grant access to the one he has chosen. Do this, you, Korah, all of you, all of your band, take fire pans and tomorrow put fire in them, lay incense on them before Yahweh, then the man who Yahweh chooses, he shall be the holy one. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. Now, remember what time it is. They, this is their second year after coming out of Egypt. They've been around Mount Sinai for a whole year. They had the inauguration of the tabernacle and the temple. The priests were anointed. The people laid hands on the Levites. Everybody was partying. No one had a gripe then. What's the problem now? So the way Moses responds to, to all of this lets you know Moses knew there was a hidden agenda. Don't just look at what was said. Listen to the voice behind what is said. Because the timing of this occurs right after what? The incident with the spies. All right. So if we are here and think about it, they all have a death sentence on them. Do you know the most dangerous people? To break out of prison is someone who is a lifer, life sentence because they killed somebody or they're on death row. Those are the most dangerous people to break out of prison because you can't do anything worse to them. You see, what are you going to do worse to me? All right says Korah in his mind. You've already told me, Yahweh says, we are going to die in this wilderness. So this is where you see everything begin, everything that was hidden, every hidden agenda begin to come up amongst the people, okay, at this point, all right? And so anyway, why did Moses respond the way he did to Korah? Okay. Because think about it, Korah was not praying and complaining about the lack of equality for everyone, all right? Because he knew they were set apart for service. He knew why they were set apart for service. He knew God already had a hierarchy of those who could come and approach the tabernacle. Now, let me say something. Korah and them were already receiving of the offerings. They had no problem with the way things were going prior to the spies, okay, in all of this. So it's not about their lack of equality, okay? It was about Korah's lack of superiority at that point. All right. Okay. If we are all equal, if all the people are holy, then I can be high priest too. That's wrong thinking. That's wrong thinking. All the people are holy. Listen to the voice. Half God said, this is another half God said, all the people are holy but not all the people have the same function within the body as it comes to God's holiness. My little toe does not have the same function as my pinky. It is still part of my body, 
and I need it. You understand what I'm saying? But my little toe needs to do what little toe does and pinky needs to do what pinky does. If either one stops functioning the way that it is supposed to, I'm going to have a problem with the body. And that's what we have, okay, right here. Okay? Datham and Abiram, all right? Former first, okay, firstborn, would have been priesthood. If they were priests, would they have been the ones who would be coming into, in, into the throne next to God? Would they be the ones who were going to be performing these sacrifices? Yes. Okay, so Korah has been able to convince all of these leaders that yeah, it's not Moses has made a mistake, guys. It is God has made a mistake. Listen to the voice. Okay, once again. Oh, this sounds familiar. Gee, I remember there was one who was what? Near the throne of God who wound up convincing a third of the angels that God was wrong and he was right. Do you see this? Now, we haven't seen that, okay, in the Bible, written in the Bible in Torah so far, but we know that happened prior to creation. So you see the same cycle of rebellion over and over and over again, all right? We did not see Satan cast out till, of course, the New Testament, okay, Yeshua says, I saw Satan fall as lightning. But where do we see the same thing going on here happening? In the garden. The serpent said, ye shall be as gods. God knows. Okay, that when you eat of this tree of knowledge, the fruit of this tree, you shall know the difference between good and evil. You'll be just like God. All the people are holy. You see, it is the same voice, different, different, different faces. Now, let me ask you something. Every time we see Someone submit themselves to speak against God to his people. Never works out well for them. Every time someone submits themselves to be the voice of the one speaking against God to his people. It never works out well for them either. It didn't work out well for the serpent. It didn't work out well even for Miriam for a while because she got struck with leprosy. It didn't work out well for the spies. And something kind of tells me it's not going to work out well for Korah, Datham, and Abiram either. Do we see a pattern here? This is why you've got to be so careful whose voice you listen to because you can become one of Satan's undercover agents and guess who you're talking and what you're talking about. They were talking about God and holiness in the congregation, how to worship in the congregation. This is why you see such church splits because it is still all about worship, how to worship God, whether you are hearing from God or not hearing from God. You understand what I'm saying? This is why churches split so often, all right? So remember, Everything up to this point was based upon an inner fear, not faith, an inner fear of what? Dying in the wilderness. Let me ask you today, what are your inner fears? 
because you will always revert back to how you were first trained. In a crisis, we will always revert backwards to a point we were comfortable with. A lot of times, okay, we get back into that. Oh God, why me? Something happens. Oh God, why me? Why is this happening? I pay my tithes. Like God really can use our money. He's sitting around waiting for us to pay him. All right. I say the Shema, okay, 50 times a day. I speak in tongues at least for 10 minutes. Come on. We get to thinking about ourselves when things go wrong. We start checking off all the things, all the favors we've done for God. Because that's how we were taught in the church. If we are good and we do these things, we're going to make it to the rapture. You understand what I'm saying? We always revert back to how we were chained. So those inner fears, that fear of dying in the wilderness is what? Now realized. It is now realized. We see that fear again expressed, okay? When we saw in Exodus chapter 14, we see that fear expressed in Exodus 16 verse three with the manna. We're hungry, we're hungry. All right, we have nothing to eat. Were they right? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. All right. Then in Exodus 17, they had no water again. Was that a genuine fear to be thirsty? Yes, hunger and thirst are not sin. How you react during those times can be. All right, now. I want you to think about something. God had shown them that he was powerful. Remember we said the three pillars of faith. Do you hear me? Are you powerful enough to do something about my situation? And do you understand me? Okay, do you understand me? All right. He says, I've heard your cries. I'm getting you up out of here. I'm redeeming you. And I'm going to jack up those, okay, who mess with you. So, so far, we've seen God do miracles in the destruction of a nation. We also saw him do the miracle of the Red Sea. So we know God is powerful. But how do we know God cares for us and hears us? I'm hungry. I want a chicken and biscuit sandwich. And what does he provide us? Manna and quail. He put a Popeyes out there. <laughs> Popeyes right out there in the wilderness. All right. So he gave that to them because what? I now need to show you I care about you. It's just like, ooh. I might have a craving for some chocolate. You might just say that and then forget about it. Boise hears that Renee got a craving for some chocolate. So he hobble on out to the car, go to the supermarket and buy her some chocolate cake. When she gets up from her nap, on the counter is a piece of chocolate cake. She had forgotten all about the craving. But because he heard her, because he loves her, because he wants to please her, because if I can't provide a piece of chocolate cake for you, baby, we got, we got bigger problems. You understand? If I can't provide the basic needs you have, you understand what I'm saying? So what is God showing us? I hear you. Even the most simple little things, I can take care of you because I love you and I care for you. You've already seen my power, so you don't doubt that. But now you need to understand, I'm not going to use that power against you. I'm going to use that power to create for you. What is it you need? Woo, glory. Okay, <laughs> glory, glory. And all of this, once again, is prior to what? 
Exodus chapter 19. Now you know I'm powerful. Now you know I really, really care for you. Then when we get to Exodus 19, he gets on bended knees and says, will you marry me? Glory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, the mountain is quaking, the trumpet sounding and everything, the cloud of glory. All right, and here we are dressed in white. Will you take Yahweh to be your lawfully wedded husband? Will you take Israel to be your lawfully wedded wife? Oh, all that Yahweh says we will do. I'm married now after Exodus 19. We're married, okay? We're married. My husband is a powerful, he's powerful. I know he loves me. I know he cares about me. I know he's going to take me to a place, okay, where he has a house already built for me, okay, and vineyards already planted. So what do we do around the year? Mount Sinai is our honeymoon. You understand honeymoon where we get to know each other. We talk to each other. Baby, I like things like this. Oh, he like it like that. Okay. I got to fix that for him like that. You understand what I'm saying? We get to know each other around Mount Sinai. There's that honeymoon and everything atmosphere there. Then it comes a time, okay, all right? After the honeymoon, it's time to take your bride to her house. Glory, all right? I prepared this place. I've been waiting 400 years for this moment. And what winds up happening? She refuses to go. Do you see why he's upset? I put up with every time you're whining, you're complaining. You see, I love you. You see, I keep my promise to you. All right. No matter what it is, you needed water. I gave you water. You needed a, a biscuit, a honey biscuit. You can make that biscuit into biscuits and honey, biscuits and gravy. You can make it into anything you want to, baby. It'll take on the flavor you give it. Come on. I've done all of these things for you. And now you get an attitude and won't go. And now you are accusing me that I don't have good judgment. That's Cora. All the people are holy. In other words, that year we spent around Mount Sinai meant nothing because I set everything in my house in order. So now here you come to want to redefine the order I've set in the house. You seem to forget it's my house. <laughs> okay. So you want to know why he responds the way he does to them. Because they chose the leaders that are now coming against, they're not coming against Moses, they're coming against him. You understand what I'm saying? So there's only one way he can respond to this. Only one way he can respond. Now, let me tell you something. This is why people need a pastor. Because without Moses, he would have destroyed all of them. If Moses hadn't interceded and reminded him, everybody knows all these nations around here know you are powerful. They saw you destroy the most powerful nation in the world. But God, they know you as a destroyer. If you want to teach them a good lesson, let them see you as a provider, how you can make a promise and you can keep it. That's what's going to draw people to you. Because if you destroy these people now, they will say you had enough power to bring them out, but you didn't have enough power to bring them in. Oh, yeah. 
okay, you're right, Moses, you're right. But I tell you what, those who spoke directly at sea, they weren't, see, God recognized they weren't speaking against Moses. You were coming against me. I will spare the people. But those who I know were speaking against me, they out of here. Okay, they are out of here. 14,700, 250, 10 spies. That's a whole lot of 14,700 people. So not just the ones that, who are those 14,700 murmurers? Okay, that died in a plague. Oh, why do we need a, a pastor? Okay, Mo, uh, Aaron, thank God you were able to run through and stop that plague on the people. You understand what I'm saying? See, when you're a lone wolf, it's you and God. And a lot of times you make certain errors, you're going to go through. And very often, a lot of times when you see me say seven days, there's been an error committed. And within seven days, you're going to see a Miriam, okay, a Miriam incident happen within that person, with that person. Because there is always a repercussion. There are always consequences when you approach God or his servant a certain way. There always is. I found that throughout the last 30 years, okay, of being in the church and everything. Always found that. Never understood it until I came to Torah. Never understood it. So, all right, we need to remember this is only the second year, not even two full years, the second year of being out of Egypt. And here we are, we got another 38 years to go. So here's something you need to pay attention to, all right? There is a particular criteria for those who are going to die in the wilderness. And we see that in Numbers chapter 14, verses 20 through 23. Okay, Numbers 14, verses 20 through 23. All right, I'll start at verse 20. And Yahweh says, I pardon as you have asked. Nevertheless, as I live, this is an oath again, as I live and as Yahweh's presence fills the whole world, none of these men who have what? Number one is C his presence. Remember, there's a criteria. Number one, who have seen my presence. Number two, and the signs I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness. So number one, they've seen his presence. Number two, they've seen the signs he performed in Egypt and the wilderness. Number three, who have tried me these many times, that word many actually is 10 times, those 10 times, and we're gonna go over that. Tried him those 10 times. And number four, have disobeyed him. That's the criteria. Now, tried him or tested him those 10 times. And of course, you know, I had to find these 10 times, so I had to think about them. Number one, now the trial is against Yahweh, testing him. First time we see that Red Sea. Remember? Oh, here come Pharaoh. Oh, God, here we go. Maybe we, number one, Red Sea. Number two, the waters, the bitter waters. Remember, they were crying out for water. Number three is the manna. Okay, number four is the Quail. Number five is water again. Remember, you have the bitter waters and then you have waters from the rock. Okay. Number six is that little incident with the golden calf. Number seven. 
Number seven is the Sabbath. Number eight, we go over to Numbers chapter 11, where they're complaining. Number nine is once again the quail, the second set of quail. Number 10, the spies. 10 tests. So criteria for those who died in the wilderness, they saw his presence. They saw the signs performed by him in Egypt and the wilderness. They tested him 10 times and he passed the test and they disobeyed his voice. Okay, those are those who, who are gonna die in the wilderness. So with all of that, once again, when we get to Korah, remember signs of mourning are what? Pulling out the hair. So what do you do? Create a bald spot. Korah's name means ball. So what are you doing? You are attacking the head. What did Korah do? Okay. Then they were cutting themselves. Signs of mourning. Self-mutilation. Different parts of the body. Affecting different parts of the body. So the one in mourning does what? not only attacks his head, but also attacks the body. Remember, congregation is what? The body. When you cut, you separate. So Korah, meaning ball, did what? He divided or cut off parts of the body, the community. When you're doing that, those are signs of extreme mourning. Because you've gone from just grief into anger and rage. And once again, Dathan and Abiram, man, that was just messing with me. Why did Moses respond the way he did? Let's go over that. Numbers chapter 16, verse number 12. Moses sent for Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. Is it not enough that you, uh-oh, uh -oh, this is personal, brought us from a land flowing with milk and honey to have us do what? Die in the wilderness. That you would also lord it over us even if you had brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey and given us possessions of fields and vineyards, should you gouge out men's eyes? We see what you're doing. We will not come. So guess what? Oh, it really comes out. You never had any intention of being submissive. You were just pretending all this time. Even if you were there, you were not going to what? come to leadership. You understand what I'm saying? So everything in a crisis is when you begin to see, see real people. Like I said, you want to see somebody? Just say no. Then that whoop, okay, real personality comes out. Just say no. Real personality will come out. Okay. They'll unzip, Take off that mask and costume they've been, and you will see the real person. All you have to do is say no. All Yahweh said was no. And what do we have? I'm not going to listen to you. I was listening to you as long as things were going good. Now that things aren't going my way, you know what? I wouldn't care even, even if you brought me over there. I have no intention. I don't even like you. <laughs> Man, Moses responds. Okay. He responds, Moses was much aggrieved and he said to Yahweh, pay no regard to their oblation. I have not taken the ass of any of them, nor have I wronged any one of them. Why did he say that? That always bothered me. 
And then I thought about it. Remember, we've been honeymooning for a whole year. Yahweh has set certain orders and certain commandments on how to deal with certain things. They are Levites. Yeah, Moses is a Levite. Levites are what? They have, uh, what am I trying? What am I trying to say? They have the rights to certain offerings. So when you bring an offering, it goes to the Levites and gets divided up. Moses is saying, I never took anything from them. I didn't even take what was rightfully mine from these people. Now, a donkey, okay, a donkey has very high esteem in Israel. How does Yeshua come riding in? On a donkey. How do you see sometimes kings riding in? On even a donkey, okay? When they were riding in the wilderness, they rode on donkeys. Moses is saying, I didn't even take one anybody's donkey to ride on. Nobody. I took nothing from nobody, God. Okay? Don't even pay attention to their offerings. Let me tell you something. Do you realize what they just said? When you come before the throne with your offering, don't even pay attention. Whatever they ask for, God, don't even pay attention. What if it's a sin offering? Don't even pay attention to that. You understand? That's the power. That's the power of a prophet. That's a power of a leader. Blessing or curses. Because they accused Moses. See, uh, Korah was actually coming against God and God's order. Dathan and Abiram were making it personal against Moses. God had already said Moses was the most humble of men. That means he wouldn't even take what was rightfully his. Okay. He, he didn't even bother with that. Okay. And so anyway, what winds up happening? We see this. All right. Moses says to Korah, once again, we see with that, each of you take your fire pan, put the incense on it. At this point, I'm praying for Moses. Because Moses knows what's getting ready to go down. Okay. When you take that, that fire, put it, that incense on there, and you bring it before Yahweh, we're going to have a Nadab and a Behu moment all over again. You understand? Moses knows what's getting ready to go down. So I got to pray for Moses. You understand? Moses, you got a little something, something in you that we didn't realize before. A little revenge. A little vengeful spirit in you, Moses, because you know by telling the people to do that, that that is contrary to the word of God. But what did they want to know? They want to know who God chose. So guess what? I'm going to let you find out for yourself. Since you didn't believe me when I told you this is what God said, I'm going to let you find out for yourself. Okay. Now, how does that end? So Korah, who's convinced everybody they're holy. Do you understand why Korah convinced them all they were holy? And if they were holy, they could go before Yahweh with the incense. They believed what Korah told them. Instead of thinking, wait a minute, Ooh, wait a minute. Now Moses is saying, wait a minute, maybe I better think about this thing twice. No. They were so caught up in who they thought they were because of Korah. Be careful who you listen to. It'll get you in trouble with God. All right? Then they do that. We know the presence of Yahweh appears to the whole community. Yahweh speaks to Moses and Aaron. I'm in uh, chapter what 16, verse number 21. Stand back from this community that I may annihilate them in an instance. But they fell on their face and said, O Elohim, source of the breath of all flesh. When one man sins, 
Will you be wrathful with the whole community? Remember, these were leaders who did what? Represented the community. They were chosen to represent how they really felt and they chose those representatives. Yahweh says, I'm destroying all of them. Moses says, uh-uh. And this whole thing is because of this one person right here. He's convinced them, but yes, they too are wrong because they had a choice. These 250 had a choice on how they responded, okay? Because they knew just as well. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the community and say, withdraw from about the abodes of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, the elders of Israel following him. He addressed the community saying, move away from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be wiped out for all their sins. So they withdrew from the abodes of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now, let me ask you something. If you saw that and you were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, don't you think you ought to come to your mind and say, well, wait a minute. Can we rethink what's going on here? I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me. I lost my mind for a moment. I was listening to the wrong voice. They see what is about to go down in front of the whole community. See, I keep telling y'all, you can be a sign and wonder for God one way or the other. Now, Dathan and Abiram had come, up, come out and stood at the entrance of their tents with their wives, their children, and their little ones. And Moses said, by this, you shall know that it was Yahweh who sent me to do all these things, that they are not of my own devising. If these men die as all men do, if their lot be the common fate of all mankind, it was not Yahweh who sent me. But if Yahweh bring about something unheard of so that the ground opens his mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down live into Sheol. You shall know that these men have spurned Yahweh, not spurned me. Who gives the command to the ground? Who are the two witnesses? Uh, 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 yeah, remember, it is the two witnesses that get to cast the first stones when they are guilty. They have the responsibility to exact the judgment. So what do we have happen here? Earth does what? Opens yeah. up. Next thing you know, Fire from heaven. Oh, hallelujah, God. This is real, guys. All right? This is why you need to understand the two witnesses were called as witnesses because they were witnesses since creation and will be until when? A new earth and a new heaven. Let me tell you something. I don't have to see what goes on. I always got two witnesses. We forget. We don't have to see each other. There are two witnesses who will respond accordingly to our obedience and our disobedience at any point in time. That is why you also need to understand what Yahweh said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, secret things belong to Yahweh, our Elohim, but those things that are revealed belong to us and the children of Israel. If we see it, we're responsible to do something about it. But if Yahweh sees it, if it's secret sin, he will do something about it. Because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, Yahweh, heaven, earth. Heaven and earth will be, Yahweh is who? The judge. Heaven and earth can be commissioned. 
to exact the punishment. Once sentence is levied against the guilty party. So we see that fire comes forth from Yahweh. Okay, now the earth opens up, they descend into Sheol. Later in, in Isaiah, it says what? Hell hath enlarged her and opened her mouth without measure. You see that? All right. Then we know that uh, Yahweh tells Moses, take the fire pans, beat them, put them on the altar, so that every time now you come before that altar, you remember, you see yourself. You see the consequence of approaching Yah the wrong way, as an example. Then we go to chapter 18. I'm not going to have the time to go through that. Chapter 18 is very important. And the reason is that now Yahweh switches from talking to Moses, and now he's talking directly to Aaron. And he sets up Aaron. I've already shown you the man in charge. Now let me show everybody else. These are the instructions. Aaron, you and your kids, I'm giving you the best of everything. Everything that they bring in here, I'm giving you the best of everything. All right. You get the best. The Levites, they are yours. Okay. So that we set this thing straight once and for all. Okay. The Levites I give to you. The people bring their best to the Levites. So look, Levites, I've already taken care of you. You're getting the best of everything. Now, all you got to do is tie, you do a tenth of the tithe goes to Aaron and the priest. Here's the one thing that I just realized. Aaron and the priest don't tithe. Because Aaron and the priest represent who? God. So a tenth is brought to Kim. He's God's representative. So when you're putting it in the hands, you're putting it in the hands here. Okay, the hands of God. And whatever else he protects. This is a beautiful financial. Churches suffer so much because people don't recognize the very ones you put it in the hands to are the ones who bless you and how they put their name upon God's name upon you. These secrets of the kingdom are what the church don't fully understand that when you are obedient to Torah, when you are obedient, it brings the blessing. What is the blessing? God puts his name on you and you are blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So anyway, I have a lot more, but we're not going to do it today. Okay. We are not going to do it today. It's two o'clock. Okay. You've got enough. You should be full by now, running over, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Okay. <laughs> About now, I gave you a lot to chew on. Yes, I kind of dramatized it. Okay, for those who are, okay, not Torah compliant, but you got the idea, right? Guys, we are there. We see what's going on in the world. We see the rebellion against leadership and whew, it's kind of scary, but uh, I don't know how well it's going to turn out for those people who are rebelling against Putin in Russia. However, however, Putin went to war against a Holocaust survivor and has viciously killed. Now, what is our prayer? Our prayer, when we have that prayer from, okay, once again, uh, uh, from uh, uh, prayers that rout demons, Turn the enemy against his cell. Isn't that what the psalm says? Turn the enemy. The, you don't see the Ukrainians been praying. Next thing you know, the army fighting them has now turned around and are fighting. Is that not what happened in the Bible? say, God turned them against themselves and the armies fought each other and the people of God just went in and collected the spoils. 
Come on, God. We see in this in the word. Lord, have mercy. So your enemies coming against you, turn them around against themselves, God. And then all you have to do is just stand still and see, oh my God, my God, my God, Jehoshaphat. All right? Lord, you see we outnumbered. Here we stand. They bombing our children. They bombing our little ones. Mm. Our wives and children and little ones are not safe. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And what does he say? Oh, send in Hebrew Institute because they got some praise uh, warriors, okay? They got some people know how to praise God, okay? They got some Holy Ghost people up in that unit and they know how to get a prayer through. Lord, protect your people, okay? And what does it say? God set ambushments and they begin to fight each other. Come on, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the same God that did it for them in the Bible is the same God that'll do it for them today is the same God that will do it for us right now. Hallelujah. And with that, Ed, pray us out. Ooh, I'm getting ready to run. I, I, I got to kind of put this. Hallelujah. I can't I feel it. Getting ready to run. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word today. Father, you never disappoint. Father, we ask you to show us more in your word. You show us more. Bless the pastor, bless this word today, Father. We pray, Father God. We pray, Lord, you put your name on us, that you bless us. We're your children, Lord. Father God, we pray you turn the enemy against themselves, Father God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth, the strength of your word. We thank you that it is just as appropriate today as it was a thousand years ago. Thank you for what you taught us today. Lord, help us to go out and live it. As always, we pray healing, Father, for those who are sick, we pray for leadership, Father God, that they may be true leaders like Moses, Father God, true and compassionate leaders. Lord, bless us, Father, today for this word we heard. Teach us how to put it into action. Bless again the pastor for this wonderful word we received today. Lord, may it nourish us in Christ's name. We thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name, we pray amen and amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen and amen, amen. All right. I'll go ahead and start with you. Start with you, Ed. Uh, well, thank you for the Barry White Mount Sinai. <laughs> but uh, this lesson was just, when I was studying this lesson last night, I kept automatically in certain names of people today who fit, the, who fit the script. And then all of a sudden in the reading last night, I see rebellion in another country on the other side of the world. I kept saying, this is too, un it, it all just came together at once. And I, I didn't believe it. I thought it was all made up. But then I kept saying, wait a minute, this is God's Torah. It's in cycles. We got to be aware of the cycles. We're in a cycle of rebellion in our country and around the world. So we got to be aware of the times we're in. We got to pray according to the word of God. And we just got to be patient that God will seize it and he will rectify it. But we are witnesses. And thank you. Thank you for Torah. Thank you to understand what's going on around. That's it. Thank you. Amen, amen. Connie? And then my friend. Friend. <laughs> Go ahead, run, Connie. You get up and run. I'm going to run. Okay. And then a Renee will run. And then Katrina will run. Okay. And then Hermine will. I know Aquila, she might already be running. That's why she's <laughs> Okay. Oh, my goodness. I was over there sitting on the couch and I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, this is an amazing lesson. It's, uh, it's just what I needed because I was praying about something and you came in with your ad adaptation of uh, love, right? And I, I was over there laughing. I don't know if you saw Ed's face, but when you were talking about uh, you ask for something, you forget about it, then they go, go and get it. You'd be like, what? And so this happened, we were in Fort Lauderdale and I had mentioned something the day before, but I wanted to try a donut. 
Do you know this man? We were in front of like he drove all the way to my Abbey. I said, what are we doing here? You forgot about the donuts? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and then I didn't even want the donuts. You know what I'm saying? So it brought me to this thing where has got when you ask God for something to be specific about what you ask him for. And don't forget, because you'd be in that same spot. Song came on today, talking about that you're in the same very spot that you prayed for. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times things happen like that in our lives. So I thought that was funny. You were laughing about that because he, he drove a long way to get some donuts. And, Lord Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> my husband, he does things like that. So I'm so uh -huh. about it. Great, great lesson. I'm just, and the things that are happening. And uh, our Torah lesson is happening right now in front of our faces. We are witnesses today that what is true in the Bible is true today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. I have a lot more on. I have a whole list of stuff over there. And I was just, just like, oh my goodness, she's on a roll again. <laughs> on a roll again. Got them vitamins. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you a question. When, when was that donut incident? Oh, that was right. We got married before. Before we got married, two years went, ago. Yeah, about two years ago. Yeah, I wanted a donut. I just want. I mentioned a donut about it was that Dunkin' Donuts. It was just something I wanted to try. He took me to the uh, something that he saw on the on, on TV or something had a whole bunch of great reviews all the way to Miami. I'm like, what are we doing here? I think some kind of voodoo donuts or something. <laughs> And I, I said, I don't, that's too many calories. I just wanted one donut. So I ended up giving it to the doorman because I couldn't eat it. He was so upset. I drove all the way over. So that's why I'm saying, be specific uh -uh. <laughs> about what you asked for. <laughs> uh, the, the, reason, the reason I'm asking you is that all this week, I have wanted a good donut. <laughs> and there's a place near here that has uh, uh, donuts. They have some of the best donuts in Tampa Bay. Uh -huh. So Monday I went there, I said, I'm gonna get me a donut. They were closed because of uh, uh, Juneteenth. <laughs> so, I said, so anyway, I still want a donut, but I don't want it from Dunkin' Donuts. I don't want it from the store or anything like that. I wanted it from this place, okay? Uh -huh. So anyway, I was do doing the uh, work here and I think it was on, um, on Thursday. So I said, oh, let me go ahead and go get this donut. So I go get the don't go to the place again, okay, to get the donut. And they were closed again. I had just missed them. Oh, so I'm in the parking lot, Lord. You don't must not want me to have a donut. <laughs> All I want is a donut. I just want one donut. Okay. <laughs> so I had to go home very, very sad again. But I understand you that do donut craving spirit. And it's so funny you brought that up now this week when I've had a craving <laughs> for a good donut. Oh my goodness, that was something. <laughs> All right, Marcia Frith. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. So to Connie, that means that Ed really loves you. So that is awesome that he went all the way to Miami to totally get you a donut. So that's called love. So um, that's awesome. And um, Ed, that was like a great uh, lesson uh, that you brought up today. Definitely just correlate into the times that we're in um, to the lesson. So I appreciated that. But um, also too, pastor, you bring up things and it's just so enlightening. Like, you know, you go through the scriptures and you're like, okay. And then you bring up like, okay, there's steps. Like you talked about the steps of mourning. And it's so funny because when you said about, you know, plucking your hair and going bald, there's some cultures in this world where when they go through mourning, they actually bald their head. Mm -hmm. um, like the wife cannot be a part of the um, funeral if her husband passed away. She's in mourning. She's locked away for like a month. So it's it's just so different, or it's it's actually revealing, I should say, how when we go through the scriptures and we dive into Torah and we pull out these different nuances, and we can see that in different cultures today, in different times today. Um, 
Also, I just wanted to bring out something because I'm like a person of words. I love words. But she had brought up Exodus 14 um, verses 13 and 14. And um, it was like, fear not, ye not stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And I remember, I think a couple of years ago, you said, see yourself in the promised land. You know, you have to see yourself and visualize yourself. And you kind of reiterated that today. And it's so funny because I listen to podcasts when I'm traveling and different things. And it's so funny, like this, I wouldn't say new age, but there's nothing new under the sun. But you have a lot of speakers nowadays and motivational speakers. And, you know, they tell you, visualize yourself in the moment, you know, visualize right, right. yourself of what you want, you know, put it on a, a, a visual board and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, I got to put my board up, I, you know, all these other things. And I'm like, God. There is nothing new under the sun. You know, we just really need to dive in this word. And if we dive into Torah and look at it and pull apart the scriptures, all these things that people are bringing up today is straight in the Torah. So mm -hmm. it's just so happened. Like I was writing down the things you were talking about, the criteria of being in the wilderness. And it's just so happened. You can relate all this stuff today. So it's always lessons to be learned. And every week we go through the tour, every time we read the tour portion, it's just like pieces that we're learning. And it's always good to share these things with people because I think if you could bring out the Torah and then relate it to the present day, I think people are more receptive to understand and welcome the Torah in their lives and use it as a tool and a guide for them today, which the Torah is, it's the teaching and instructions of y'all. So thank you, pastor, as always. Love you guys. Miss you guys. And Renee and Boise, I, got, I didn't get to say happy anniversary to you guys the last time, but love you guys. I just love to see you guys together on video. Um, boys, we hope you're getting well. And to all you guys, love you. Love you so much. Love you, pastor. I guess I'll see you soon. I didn't get your text. So I put on my little praise dance emoji thing for okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, praise God. All right, Aquila. Shalom, everyone. No. I'm not going to say too much. I open my mouth and I'm going to lose everything because this is a great lesson. <laughs> and I just want to chew on it. Like the older people say, just chew on the cud. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pastor, and thank you, people of the Most High. Uh, I want, I did laugh at a time when you said you so many great things. I, I, I'm not going to even begin to. I got a recital here, but you were saying, uh, why would the Most High tell a fib to someone else? Who do they think they are that He has to lie to them? <laughs> and I said, she sure. She, she knows how to put words together. And that really made me think even about myself. You know, it's impossible for him to lie and not keep his promises and his words. So who are we to think he's not going to do that just because we are? Is he afraid of you? <laughs> so that, that's that. I'm just going to leave it there. I'm just going <laughs> to chew on this. Thank you so much. And thank you most high for anointing her to give us the word. And we walk in it. And one last thing, when I saw this Russian deal last night, I thought the same thing. I said, Mo, they must have heard some rattling in the mulberry trees. I say, you know, they went against each other. And I'm sorry, I say, I begin to thank the most high. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Because, you know, who, <laughs> who, well, I remember praying when this first happened that that would happen. Yes. And I just, I, I'm just praying that the most high just, get it together because it's it's kind of a hot battle yeah so be blessed everyone thank you you too amen amen uh katrina shabbat shalom to everyone hello y'all look so cute i love your little black and white sis pastor um uh, Miss uh, Hamain, that is so cute. Y'all all dressed alike. Y'all know it. I don't think y'all know that now, but y'all look cute. <laughs> oh, praise y'all. What I wanted to say was, uh, Cora, he did not appreciate the gift and the title that the father had gave him and what he was under to hold the ark because the father blessed us with different gifts He because he knows us and he loves us. 
And the main thing is that like Balaam, he told Balaam, I cannot curse for God has blessed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Yeah. <laughs> I love you all. Y'all look so beautiful. I love you, sis, bro. I love you. <laughs> all right. That was a bit of wisdom there. Bit of wisdom there. Yes. All right. Uh, let me see her mean. I'm glad everybody else went before me because I'll tell you, I don't have to repeat anything. <laughs> I loved every second. I want to hear this one all over again. I mean, I was cracking up at every turn. It's just marvelous the way the father demos to you. And I'm just so grateful that uh, you express it so well. And, and, and I can get it, <laughs> you know, uh, is, um, is wonderful too and i just thank him to be a part to be a part of this group is just it keeps hitting me every time thank you thank you thank you Abba, you know for doing this in my life i mean you know i'm close to 90 here and uh, and so i i could have missed it but he didn't allow me to be a part of you and and to to grab and, and hold on to these wonderful gems. I'm just, I'm just so excited that he uh, shows his hair <laughs> so much. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm part of that list. <laughs> he shows his care. And this is certainly one of the biggies for me. So thank you, Abba. He's precious and, uh, and you're precious. You're all precious. I love you all. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Abba. You, Thank you, Lord. Boise and Renee, like I always say, he will he will talk to you according to your personality. He doesn't talk to everyone the same way. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I just wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is what it is, God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, passing a powerful message again, and uh, man, I just thank you, Marcia, sister, and uh, and her mean, Amen. wonderful her words, just like all of our words, love and being part of this family, this uh, ministry. Thank you, Ed, brother Ed, powerful, powerful teaching. Uh, it's just an eye opener. Things that you study and research. And I mean, I appreciate you, brother, uh, a lot. Every time I hear your research, coming back with these understanding that I never had. And I thank you, Pastor, that the Most High put in your heart to uh, give those lessons to Ed like that, brother Ed, because I tell you, it's very powerful to me. Amazing. I mean, they're really powerful, and I'm thankful. And again, Pastor, everything you said is true. And I, I agree with her mean, uh, I don't really need to say nothing. The Most High said it through you everything. And so we just need to be obedient. But it's one thing I would love to see on the uh, uh, Barnes and Nobles, you know, is uh, uh, obedience for blessings for dummies. <laughs> I would, if, if we get that out, I believe the ministry would be Multi-billionaire right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. dummies in the world, and I'm going to tell you that. They need that book. <laughs> but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I, I, and I told me, my, my wife was uh, uh, just laying in the bed one night, and we were talking about how much we love the Most High, mm -hmm. how beautiful he is to allow us to be able to experience me greatly, Torah, in such a way with my wife and under this ministry, because my heart was always towards him, but I never understood what you sharing with me. This is so beautiful. That's why I love it. I just love this ministry. I love it. I mean, when it comes, if I'm not sick or nothing, you always see me Thursday night, I'm there, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, I love this and just, you know, 
a time you can be under ministry and they say good things and stuff, but not like this because they get boring. They get and then they, church get mundane. I get tired of this stuff. But the power of the most high through you, Pastor, is not bragging in a, in a fleshly way, but in a in a powerful spiritual way. The most high have blessed you beyond blessings for me and my wife to experience such understanding and how you just just pour out such love to us through such words and everything that's going on. It just, I mean, like my wife said, she looked at this house. She said, wow, man, the most high did this because I mean, before I was here, it's a lot of stuff that was not, not even done, man. We got paintings. I did, man, stuff that with my wife. This house looked like, I mean, I think it went up around $100,000. <laughs> this stuff in this house that will shock everybody and stuff. It was the most high. It's because of people and family like Hebrew Institute that helped me to be better than what I am. Again, Hebrew Institute family, I love you. I love you, every last one of you. I might not name y'all, but please, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love the queen, my wife. I, I do get a chocolate cake too. I'm gonna get a chocolate cake down the road for it too. Goodbye, <laughs> <laughs> everybody. Thank you so very much. And that was so sweet. But I think, like Pastor, you said something that really, really touched me is that this was something that was coming down the road. The Most High declares the end from the beginning. And the same way that men were in rebellion, the same way the people that are in obedience. And as I look around at the faces, he saw all this day coming that Pastor Charlotte Israel was going to come with that word and that the children, the flock, would be in obedience and say, yes, Father, the song that you play, yes to your will, yes to your way, we submit, we surrender. And heaven and earth are faithful witnesses because his name is on us and said, I'm going to bless them. I don't. I know that saying, Father, we don't know which way, but we thank you for the way. We do know which way. You said, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper. I know that. I know the thoughts I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future yeah. and hope. We're the other side of that coin, and I'm so grateful because there were times we were the other side of that coin saying, help, help, help. Hey, come on, Renee. Hey. So, uh -huh, lady, I later both say, I'm so happy, and I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for the midnight calls and the midnight texts. I'm, I'm thankful for a girl go to sleep. Stop <laughs> texting. Hang up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for it, but I'm also grateful from the rock that I came from. I'm grateful for my grandma. I'm grateful for my sister right there. My, my, that, that, that's mm -hmm. 11 years old. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the ones on this line. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the rock, like you said, Pastor, because you can, times of Christ, you go back to things that you go to. And I felt so good. Thank you for that that you sent me. I got it. And I'm telling you what. Okay. Okay. Yes. Before service today. Cabbage and greens and smoked turkey, banana pudding, and, ch and chipotle chicken. Wow. Four. The most high is something else. So thank you. Thank you for that love. The same way he'll go out and fix and grab me what I want, the same way he'll say, get up and push the Yes. The bride does the same as the bridegroom because uh -huh. we love our father. We love our Abba because our bridegroom is coming. Come on, man. So love you, love you, love you. And see it, know without a shadow of a doubt, honey, we miss you and we thank the Father for you when we travel and we pray for O'Neill. We pray for Kwame, like I pray for DJ and Kayla, yeah. and Trina and our families. We love you. It's way for Marcy and Daniel, our whole family. Aquila, and I don't know, uh, Miss Aquila, Mother Aquila, was your, it was a daughter, somebody named Ivy. Sometimes it'll just pop Ivy. in my the, Yes. Ivy, Ivy, my niece, uh-huh. Yes, and pray. So I just thank the Father for you all, and I love Connie and Ed. They just tickle me talking. <laughs> They're just beautiful. Her man is so tenderhearted. Yeah. And Stephanie and Melissa, all of you yeah. are blessings. Blessings, blessings, yeah. blessings. And Pastor, we love you so, so much. Thank you. And my parents love you. They mention you too. So I tell you, it's made an impact. 
So blessings to y'all. Yeah. True Praise love. God. Praise Praise God. God. Praise God. Marcia Austin. And then uh, Stephanie. I think that's, yeah. And then Brad and Jenny afterwards. Oh. Oh, I praise God for a praying family. Thank you, family. Amen. Thank you so Hallelujah. Much. Oh, I tell you, because sometimes you, you go through stuff and then you, you, you come out of it and you say, somebody's been praying for me. So I thank God for where Ooh, I'm at. Amen. Thank you so much. I mean, every time pastor goes through this, uh, this sort of portion with this rebellion, it's, it's such a scary thing, you know, but it, it reminds us and shows us, you know, that we really, really have to say, God, your will, not ours. Because sometimes we think it's, it's, uh, it's God's will, but it's really ours. So yeah. we really have to stay prayed up. So thank you, Pastor Israel, for everything. And I'm thinking about this, this submersible um, implosion that happened. That's a, a bit of rebellion, too, because that, that CEO didn't even heed the advice of some of the folks that were telling him, you know, not to go on this run because certain things had to be done. So you see the the Torah portion happening and in, in all over, yep. you know, the, our, our area. So thank you, Pastor Israel, for just uh, beating us over our head with stuff, but it's good. It's good. So thank you. Praise the most high. Praise the most high. And let me tell you, a lot of times, it's just like you put a thought here, put a thought there, just a sentence on a piece of paper. And I'm sitting here before service starts and like, God, this be a good time. <laughs> it's not for your people. God, okay. <laughs> All right. If not, can we do a rapture right now? I don't teach it, but hey, it'll be a good time. Okay. And he'll just zoop. There it goes. You know, there it goes. There it goes. He just put, he puts it together because you guys are hungry. He knows you have a hunger <laughs> and a thirst and you have ears to hear. Okay. I can't take any, any credit. He knows what, you know, he just, I can't, all I can say is thank God he does. Okay. Cause otherwise I'd be sitting here looking at you. Y'all be looking at me. We just be looking at each other. You know? <laughs> Anybody got anything to say? Okay. <laughs> but uh, to let you know today, I was, I was going through something. I'll be honest. I was really, really going through something today. I closed on the house on Monday. Okay. I closed on the house on Monday. Uh, we already did the preliminary uh, papers for closing. I did online uh, yesterday, uh, sent the uh, rest of the uh, funds in and everything and got them in one minute with one minute to spare. Okay. Because they were having difficulties, one minute to spare. And then last night, uh, it was about 10 o'clock. I got an email from the uh, title company and they put on there, oh, funds received. You know, and it was like, hallelujah. And so 9.30 on Monday, we go look at the house for the final, you know, walk through. And then 10.30, okay, is the uh, closing, okay, and everything. And all I could do, you know, it's like, regardless of everything, let me tell you, I would just be honest. I would do anything to have my daughter back. It doesn't, mm -hmm. I, I would do anything. I would do anything, 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 God you know, to have my daughter back, you know, it's good to have the house and all of that, but I would do anything. The only reason that we're doing this is because I don't have her and I would do anything for that, you know, but you can't go backwards. That's what God keeps saying. You got to move forward, you know, and he impressed upon me. Dorian's desire was to always have a place for her mother to stay. Okay, her mother and her family to stay. And she provided that. She still provided that. So, you know, even so, you know, uh, Lord, my will, this was not my will, but thine will be done, you know, with this. I don't understand the reasons why. I don't, and I, it's not for me to understand. It's just for me to trust God. There are times when you just have to trust God, regardless of what it looks like, you know, and Isaiah touched my heart. So I said, Isaiah, Soon, this time next week, it was late last night, this time next week, we'll be sleeping in our own house and our own bed again. He texts me back a little later. He goes, I can't wait. It's been a year and a half since I've slept in my own bed. And I thought oh, about boy. that because he put all of his stuff in storage and everything after Dorian because you know, to come and live with me because I needed help. He knew I needed help. So he gave up a lot of his life just to come and stay with his mother. And that just, just mm -hmm. touched me so much, 
you know, uh, that he would do that, you know, that, that I, I didn't even realize that it's been over a year and a half, you know, and so uh, um, we all make, you know, sacrifices and everything. We don't know why God does certain things at certain times, you know, but he does. He does. He does. And I was thinking about it this morning. I said, oh my God, the people whose house I am purchasing purchased their house the same time that Dorian purchased our old house in 2017. It's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and it's like, oh my God, you know, I don't know what to say. You see his hand in so many things, in so many ways. I still will say, Lord, if there was any other way, we would accept it. But his will be done. And that's all. One day, you know, just knowing, yeah, I'll be back with my daughter again. She's still watching over her mama. She's still watching over her mama. Okay, you know, and with her grandma, oh, grandma's still watching over me too, okay? Daddy's still watching over me, okay? And all three of them together, all still watching over us and everything. And it's like, God, look at you. Look at you, okay? The great and mighty things you're doing, you know, in the world with this tiny little ministry, tiny little ministry, okay, over you with the kids and everything, keeping them safe, okay? With the election, someone just told me, I asked him, how are things with the election? Rabbi, went. he said he went different places and there's been shalom, okay? And I don't know if uh, everything is still in shalom, but they were anticipating, you know, rough riots and all of that. And all we could do is just pray for shalom, okay, with that. So still keep Sierra Leone in prayer that regardless of whatever the results are, that they be accepted it by the people as long as they are honest honest results we're not going to get into the stuff like we did over here okay craziness and everything so just you know pray for shalom and everything all right stephanie and melissa oh you want me i gather you want me to read that okay May we all learn and strive with an earnest heart to walk in greater humility, contentment, gentleness, and in repentance towards all people. And may Yah bring unity and peace between his brothers and sisters. As it is written, he named Matovuma Naim Shevet Akim Gan Yachad. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Psalm 133 1. Uh, here is a warning to each one of us here today. Yahweh hates strife, discord, and division between the set-apart ones. Amen, amen. Calling the one who sows them in an abomination. These things, these six things, the great and mighty El hates. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. The one who sows discord among the brethren. Amen mm -hmm. and amen. We know that from, you know, po Proverbs. Oh, do we Okay, uh, Proverbs uh, 19, okay. Uh, discord, disharmony, dissonance, uh, cacophony, clamor, clinker, harshness, to name a few, sound like any of us. Look these words up. Don't fool yourselves to thinking you are not part of this because you may see yourself above this. It's not wise. He is ill, okay, be dealt with. He proclaimed he hates it. This is strong language. Pay attention. Are any of us guilty of these very same things within our thoughts? Repent, the kingdom of the mighty L is near, and we will decide where we end up. As for us and our house, we will serve Yahweh in spirit and in truth. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, did I miss it? Is still on. Ah, Rich and Lena. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to talk. Yeah, I'm standing out in the outside the uh, place with the jacket on. Okay, okay. I didn't think you were going to be able to speak. That's why I didn't go to you first. Next time I'll go to you first. How How is okay, it? Okay, that's fine. How is Arizona? Oh, it's wonderful. Arizona is cool. We woke up at 34 degrees this morning. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Oh, it's cold. It's still cold. I have my jacket on. She's cold. I had to take my flannel shirt off. It's 82 now. 
So it's risen 40 to 50 degrees in six hours. It, anyway, I really like your uh, title All that right. you just gave us. Yes, that was great. I, I just kind of giggle at that. Keep your attitude to yourself. Amen, amen. And um, yes, and that's what we should do, all do sometimes. Amen. Sometimes amen, we don't. Amen, amen, amen. And also, we need to listen to the voice of Elohim instead of uh, the serpent or the enemies. Uh, sometimes I... I do sometimes do that too, and I repent once in a while. Uh, I really enjoyed your uh, uh, talking about how God took the Israelites through the wilderness and finally, you know, with all the trials. And that's what we are doing as a believer in Yeshua too, that we first are in the world. And then he took us through the uh, wilderness and then in the wilderness, we complain, we do this and that and all that stuff. It's really, it's, it's like uh, doing, doing a circle of our lives again. Thank you very much for that, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Good to hear from you guys. Yeah, we're doing fine. Good, good. So, Brad, oh, go ahead, go ahead. That's it. Oh, okay, okay. Brad and Jenny. I think uh, Stephanie and them have another comment that she said about me. Melissa had something. If you want to read it. Oh, okay. I found an interesting connection between Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Cain equals pride of life full of murder. Belam, lust of the flesh, greed of gain. Korah, lust of the eyes, power hungry. My way is better. Are we there yet? Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, Brad and Jenny. Yeah, I, I uh, have a little short audio clip I want to play. Okay. That's all right with you. Yep. All right. That's real short. Moses was a mighty Hebrew man, Aaron brave and sure. They led Israel on a peace like night, a 40 year tour, a 40 year tour. Moses, okay, died of a plague by the will of Yahweh. I just want Yahweh's will in my life. <laughs> 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 I'm going to let you on a little secret right now. When y'all ask me to pray for you, that's exactly what I pray. Lord, thy will be done. <laughs> all of this man of stuff. Yahweh's will in my life. And that's one of the uh, classic audio clips that we made some years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for that. I needed that laugh. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> Listen, I can't top that. Okay. I just give God all the glory, honor, and praise. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, right. love it. <laughs> Brad, uh, can you attach that that clip? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll. The, uh, the, yeah. Hey, <laughs> the, 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 in the email. Yeah. I, I remember that. I just want Yahweh's will in my life. 
Okay. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen and amen. All right, guys. All right, guys. See you on uh, Thursday, probably. <laughs>